from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast, this is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day, she was severely injured in a farming accident, but she continues to battle back. This is as far as I can go, but I am going. How important is USMCA? Just ask the apple industry. And what we have seen is a direct impact. Plus, why this week is so important when it comes to trade talks between the US and China. I think this is a very important week for these trade talks because we're gonna finally have to see pencil put to paper. Ag Day, presented by the all new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. We're getting ready for what could be an extremely dangerous winter storm, bringing with it snow and ice to large portions of the U.S. Winter storm warnings are up for a large area, even places like Las Vegas seeing snow earlier this week. The system now going all the way from the southern Rockies to the central and southern plains, also included the Midwest, Ohio Valley, portions of the Appalachians, and the Mid-Atlantic. Along with snow, some areas could see freezing rain and sleet. Meteorologist Cindy Clausen is tracking all of this for us. The storm, Cindy, has already brought some substantial snow. Yeah, that it has, Clinton. We've heard from parts of the southwest of 10, 20, even more inches of snow, and that's going to be moving through the plains today. This is the snowfall estimate, and you can see that through 7 a.m. Wednesday, we have been seeing a lot of snow already into the plain states, and so this is our, our estimate of over eight inches of snow uh, that has fallen in parts of the Plain States, Nebraska, over towards Iowa and into southwestern Minnesota. And as we add on the next 24 hours, you can see the low actually tracks a little bit further to the northeast. So we add more to that, especially into the upper Midwest. And we really start to see another system bringing a lot more moisture to those higher elevations in the west. And then to the mid-Atlantic states, we're going to see a fair amount of snow, especially closer to the D.C. area and up into Maine. Now, some of this is going to be ice. We need to be careful with that as well. So ice accumulation in parts of the Plain States, parts of the Corn Belt over the next 24 hours, we're going to see that really affecting especially folks in the eastern states as you get over towards Maryland and Virginia and Pennsylvania and even areas northeast. We're looking at a, a real, real mess over the next 24 to 36 hours. I'll have more on your forecast coming up a little bit later on. While this winter storm is big, we've seen all kinds of wild weather this winter. We talked with USDA meteorologist Brad Rip about the season so far. This is just kind of a continuation of a very active winter weather pattern that we've been experiencing in the United States. And I think a lot of that you can attribute to El Nino, which is now officially in place. So we've been kind of ramping up towards it for the last four or five months. And this is certainly a contributing factor to the incredible storminess that we've seen stretching all the way from Hawaii to the Pacific coast then extending eastward across much of the continental United States. We'll have more on his outlook for spring tomorrow on Ag Day. A delegation of Chinese officials has arrived in the U.S. to continue talking trade. China's chief negotiator, Vice Premier Liu He, is meeting with Deputy U.S. Trade Representative Jeffrey Garish. High-level talks taking place Thursday and Friday will be led by U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. And talks continue in Beijing as well. China's foreign minister met with U.S. business and trade leaders yesterday. Wang Yi, China's foreign minister, shook hands with U.S. Chamber of Commerce Vice President Myron Brilliant, both sides expressing hope that a trade deal can be reached. The meeting follows talks last week in Beijing that Lighthizer said made headway on key issues. This will not be done this week. Uh, I think there should be substantial progress this week. And uh, the, the thornier issues with their economy, structural issues, the intellectual property, the forced transfer of, of business practices, that's going to take a, a, a meeting between Xi and Trump and probably more on that as well. Without an agreement, a 10% tariff increase imposed in July on 200 billion U.S. dollars of Chinese goods is due to rise to 25% at the beginning of March. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue saying some of the progress that's being made is in the negotiations to get China to lift its barriers to U.S. ag exports. Purdue saying U.S. and Chinese negotiators continue to deal with a wide variety of barriers the U.S. would like to see removed, especially China's biotech trait approval system. 
But Purdue says he believes progress was being made on that issue. USDA Trade Undersecretary Ted McKinney and USDR Chief Agricultural Negotiator Greg Dowd are representing agriculture this week during the talks. The pork industry continues to monitor the recent outbreak of African swine fever in China. Now word that cases are spreading, this time to Vietnam. Reuters reporting it was found on three farms southeast of Hanoi. Pigs on all three farms were culled. It's believed the disease has killed more than a million pigs in China. Now China recently recalled frozen dumplings that may have been contaminated with African swine fever. That's after some of the dumplings tested positive for the virus. The disease is not harmful to people, but it is incurable right now in pigs. Top agricultural representatives from the United States, Canada and Mexico will all be under one roof in Washington, D.C. this week as there's hope the USMCA could be one step closer to reality. Betsy Jibben joins us now with more. Betsy. Clinton, USDA Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue, along with Canada's Minister of Ag and Mexico's Secretary of Ag, all set to meet and speak at USDA's annual Agricultural Outlook Forum. There's talk the three will push the trilateral deal called USMCA along as all three countries still need to ratify it. The Washington Apple Commission saying exports are decreasing due to trade tariffs and barriers. Representatives say exports still decreasing with the two countries, even though a deal has been struck. So Mexico is our number one export market. Um, we have a three-year average of shipping 13 million boxes to Mexico and it makes up about 30 percent of all of our Apple exports. Um, so it is a, a key uh, market for us and what we have seen is a direct impact. The commission says Mexico is the number one export market. Canada is, on average, the number two export market for Washington apples. Canada and Mexico combined represent about half of Washington's apple exports. It's, it's been uh, consistently down about 30 percent um, and it hasn't really picked up since news of the USMCA ratification. Um, and we try and clarify that um, even with the ratification of the USMCA does not necessarily mean that the 20% tariff on U.S. apples is removed. They're separate. Tariffs are still in effect on U.S. ag goods despite a potential trilateral deal. That's because the administration still has steel and aluminum tariffs in place on other countries. According to Farm Journal Washington, D.C. correspondent Jim Wiesmeyer, Canadian Foreign Minister Krista Freeland met with U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and other Democrats over the weekend, pressuring them to lift tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum. President Trump not lifting tariffs, saying they are necessary to further a rebound in U.S. steel production. Other ag groups wanting progress on USMCA, too. If it's not signed, well, the NAFTA still is uh, operating underneath it right now. But the true question is, will the president pull us out of NAFTA? And that is a possible outcome. For the U.S. to ratify the deal, our Washington correspondent Jim Wiesmeyer says the International Trade Commission is required to complete a report. There could be hearings held by the House Ways and Means and Senate Finance panels. And then text must be submitted. There are just some of the steps which need to happen before verbiage is introduced in the House and Senate. Clinton. Betsy, thanks. The government is back in business following the shutdown, but it means getting the new farm bill in place is taking longer. Next week, USDA is set to hold a listening session to hear questions and concerns. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue is also going to go in front of the House U.S. Ag Committee, where he's expected to receive some questions on the farm bill. I would say not too far behind, but they are further behind than most uh, bills, uh, you know, primarily because of that delay. Some departments, including select USDA staff, continue to work throughout the shutdown. Those were employees who worked on the implementation. Here's a possible benefit to the freezing conditions. A new study says the polar vortex may kill 95% of the stink bugs that didn't find a warm place this winter. A news release from the National Pest Management Association credits an experiment from Virginia Tech for that information. It also says pests like the emerald ash borer and the southern pine beetle could also be killed off. Unfortunately, bed bugs and roaches aren't affected by the cold. They more than likely already laid their eggs, which will hatch when it gets warm. We're getting ready for spring planning by talking about corn acres. That's coming up next and later is some great news to share with you about a woman seriously injured in a farming accident. Her remarkable road to recovery coming up in the country.
Ag Day, brought to you by Precision Planting, provider of practical and effective precision ag technologies to help make farmers smarter every season. Learn more at precisionplanting.com. In agribusiness, corn moved lower on Tuesday on reports of favorable weather in Brazil. Here's more on what moved those markets on Tuesday from the floor of the CME in Chicago. Under pressure pretty much all day long after a three-day holiday weekend, and we are sort of breaking out to the downside or attempting to in corn and soybeans after wheat has already done so. Uh, wheat started the party lower here er early this morning. Uh, we had export inspections that were underwhelming. That did not help things. And wheat continues to try to find lows. So wheat being down over double digits really weighed on corn, and corn kind of followed. Corn is really now challenging some very key support points, breaking through some of that. Uh, and this trend line, the sideways trade that we've been in for a while, it looks like we're trying to open the door to the downside and maybe see a little bit more of a flush out. Once again, this is Ted Seifert of Zaner Ag Hedge coming to you from the CME floor. Planners are rolling along the Gulf Coast here mid-February, but analysts are still looking for signals as to planning intentions for 2019. Ty Morgan picks up the conversation from the road. Hey now with Chip Nellinger, Blue Reef Agri Marketing. Chip, when we look at this corn market, and you know, a lot of talk right now, here we set in February, a lot of talk about acreage. Uh, you know, something we could see a major boost in, in corn acreage, but what if we don't? What if we don't see a few more million acres of corn this year? Yeah, I think uh, that's a big question, and, and I question whether we will see a few million more. I, I could see a million and a half, two million. I, I just think Mother Nature uh, didn't cooperate this past uh, fall. Right. A lot of field work. It's very, very wet in many areas right now. Prices of inputs have gone up. I don't see a massive shift to corn. If we don't see that, if it is only a million and a half, two million acres, that puts the bar that much higher that we raise another big crop because our demand base uh, is still big. We're cutting carry out year over year. We've cut the world corn carry out uh, pretty dramatically and uh, there's no margin for error. So, um, you know, it's going to be an interesting, uh, you know, next couple of months here as we await that, uh, that acreage report. Well, we have seen that carry out tighten a little bit. And so why haven't corn, res corn prices responded in that way? Yeah, I, I think part of it is there's still a, lo a large supply of old crop around. Um, I think part of it is the bean market in this tariff situation. I think arguably if we didn't have the tariff situation, um, beans uh, would be higher and corn would be at least 15 to 20 cents higher than where it is currently. So I blame that on the, the China trade talks. What's the biggest risk in corn right now? Well, I think the biggest risk in corn is the bean market. Uh, I really do. I think beans uh, are the weak link to everything. Massive stocks domestically, increasing world stocks. Um, if we don't see that upside, even if we don't plant as many corn acres, it will be because beans tumble lower because they're oversupplied. So I, I think the big risk in corn is the bean market, unfortunately. All right, Chip Nellinger, thank you so much. Let's take a quick break and then we'll have a check of weather right here on Ag Day. Farming has changed. Markets are riskier than ever. For customized, focused commodity marketing, contact Chip Nellinger or Adam Dreyer at 309-550-7213. You could win a 2019 John Deere Gator. No purchase necessary. Visit ValentFullyLoaded.com for details and official rules. Cindy, check this photo shared with us by the Idaho Transportation Department. Just look at all that snow. Idaho Farm Bureau reporting saying all the moisture the area has received over the past week is translating into much needed snowpack in the mountains. Now this photo was taken in Canyon Creek. Wow, a big job trying to clear that path. And Cindy, and that storm you mentioned at the top of the show, look at the size of that. I mean, just huge across the eastern half of the country. Exactly, and it really is going to have a lot of impacts. The snow, the ice in particular, for a lot of the folks across the eastern part of the country. Let's get straight to it. Yeah, and as Clinton mentioned, this is a very big storm, and you can see snow on the northern edge of this. So it looks like we're going to be seeing a fair amount of it here in the upper Midwest. And we're look, still looking at some of these areas to see 6, 10, even maybe up to a foot of snow on these northern reaches. It's going to be ice for some areas as well, and that's where you see that orange. So we'll have to really kind of watch that, especially it looks like, like it could be worse right in this area, Virginia, parts of Maryland as well. Putting this into motion, you can see the low moves up to the north. Look at that ice spreading into the eastern part of the country. So that's going to be some nasty travel on the roads. It could obviously cause uh, some damage to vegetation as well. We start to see more snow coming into 
the western states as we have a couple of lows there. We start to see quieter conditions behind this storm for a couple of days in the nation's midsection. But as we head through Wednesday night into Thursday morning, we're going to see everything push on off to the east. The snow eventually on up into Canada and then off and then we have rain on the trailing cold front that's going to be still moving through the southeastern part of the country and then through the day on Thursday still see that that rain in the southeast even trailing back into parts of Texas high pressure keeping the Corn Belt then dry as we get into Thursday still some snow and even some uh, wintry mix in parts of the Four Corners region. Now we already showed you the snow estimate but when you factor the liquid content yeah we're seeing a lot of it especially along that front in the southeastern United States into the mid Atlantic and of course we have a, a fair amount with the snows in the upper elevations in the west as well. Temperature wise we're seeing teens and 20s of oh, Bismarck almost warm compared to some of their temperatures you've seen recently. We get up to 80 by the time you get down to Miami. Then as we get into the overnight hours, we'll see those lows in the single digits in the north central United States. A lot of 20s and 30s across the nation's midsection, and then we can kind of see where that front is. Look at that, a low of 63 in New Orleans, but when you get up towards Memphis, a 37 degree overnight low. And then as we get into tomorrow, we're going to be seeing temperatures pretty similar in most areas. As far as that jet stream, there's that big trough in the west, and so that front, everything is kind of on the leading edge of that. So some cooler temperatures still expected, even as we get into the latter part of this week, kind of warming up this weekend, but we'll see a couple more disturbances, especially in the northern parts of the United States. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check on the weather where you live. Pierce, Idaho, snow likely for you today with a high of 32 degrees. Janesville, Wisconsin, a wintry mix, a high of 33 degrees. And Walkersville, Maryland, snow, sleet, freezing rain for you as well, high and low of 32. The investigation is complete on that E. coli outbreak involving romaine lettuce. What investigators found and didn't find next. Ag Day, brought to you by ESN Smart Nitrogen, the smartest way to reduce nitrogen losses to wet soil, hot, dry conditions, or microbial attacks in standing water. Learn more at smartnitrogen.com. A Food and Drug Administration report on the romaine lettuce E. coli outbreak offers no smoking gun. That's according to our news gathering partners at the Packer. The report says of the more than 150 samples taken from several farms in coastal California counties, only one test positive with the same rare genetic fingerprint. That was from a reservoir in Santa Barbara County. It was used by Adams Brothers Farming. It's believed the Adams Brothers field was contaminated by using the reservoir for agricultural water. Other fields did not use the same water source, but may have also been a source of tainted lettuce. Now, it's not known how E. coli made it into the reservoir. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says it will buy $4.5 million of fresh oranges. They will be sent to several food nutrition assistance programs. The agency will be buying size 138 and larger oranges. They will be delivered from April 17th through May 29th. You've been asking, how's she doing? Well, coming up, we have some good news on a woman who lost a leg and an arm in a horrible farming accident. Explore cotton production and profitability at two upcoming events in Lubbock, Texas on February 26th and Tifton, Georgia on February 28th. Register for free online today. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. We brought you this woman's story at Christmas. Lori Hatter Hain is a farmer in Marshall County, Indiana. Her life changed on the second day of harvest in September. Lori was struck on the left side by the corn head of the combine. She lost her arm and leg on that side as a result. Now, so many of you have asked how Lori's doing, and now we can share this update with you. Take a look. Hey, everyone. As you can see, my husband has me on a very tight leash right now. This is as far as I can go. But I am going. This is Saturday. I picked up the leg Thursday night. I did rehab on Friday. And today, I am on a treadmill. Lori posted this video on Facebook. She says that tight leash she refers to is something her husband set up. He installed a log chain above the treadmill with a harness. It's to help keep her stable if she falls. Now, Lori had been looking forward to getting that prosthetic leg since Christmas. 
She used to be an avid hiker and says she plans on doing it again. We know Lori's can-do attitude and infectious personality will help carry her through this next step in her recovery process, and we wish her the very best. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in and spent part of your day with us. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.